Hi, welcome back to Elite Literary Book Group. I'm Rachel Beck. And uh, this part is Al Brookham and elsewhere. And then uh, I think it's back to Christminster and then it's going to end finally. So um, it, it starts off kind of positive, like they both got divorced. Um, but it, there's kind of an interesting thing happening here. You know, the, the laws are sort of changing at the time that uh, Hardy is writing this. And he actually uh, had a close friend who was a judge uh, who heard cases like, kind of like what he's alluding to in this um, chapter. And so they begin, they, they get a letter that um, it, it sounds like uh, Sue's divorce is final. And he says something about, you know, Arabella's, so we know some time has passed. But um, she makes a comment about there's still something kind of unsettling about it since we did this under false pretenses. And what, what she's referring to is the fact that when you got divorced, the, the law was that you could do it if the woman committed adultery, okay? Um, and then it, there was some stipulation with the, the man, uh, specifically his adultery had to be like incestuous, homosexual, or said something like cruel uh, adultery. <laughs> so, I don't know, making your wife watch, I don't know. Something cruel couldn't just be that you uh, had a fling. That wouldn't be enough. So. You can already see that it's not equal. But the the tricky bit um, was that it could not be because husband and wife decided together that they didn't want to be together anymore for whatever reason. And in legal terms, they were they cannot collude with each other. You can't plan this. And the judge would tell Thomas Hardy some funny stories about how people tried to get around this. And so one guy um, hired a detective, and he went out of town, supposedly. But the detective's there, and he's watching the house, and the husband comes back in a disguise, and the wife opens the door, and they pretend they're lovers. Um, but, I mean, they, they knew they were just pretending. But that, that was the kind of thing that you had to do. It's, it's a little bit ironic, because the morally correct thing to do at this point would to be go ahead and, and have an affair so you could be legally in the right. But if you didn't want to have an affair, um, you, you weren't morally, legally in the right to leave. So uh, if you look at like Phillotson's situation, Phillotson does assume that Sue is sleeping or has uh, slept with Jude but she hasn't yet she will but she's gonna hold off as long as she can and um, in, in Arabella's case it's a little bit more like she committed adultery but I mean it was a little more than adultery she's married to somebody else and Jude's keeping that a secret so in a way both couples are colluding which is against this law. But anyway, so um, it gets kind of interesting. Fortunately for them, that none of them are a big enough deal uh, at this point to look into it, to see if, you know, there was any colluding there. And Jude says, one thing is certain, that however the decree may be brought about, a marriage is dissolved when it is dissolved. There's advantage to being poor, obscure people like us. And you notice he uses the word obscure a lot. Um, that things are done for us in a rough and ready fashion. It was the same with me and Arabella. I was afraid her criminal second marriage would have been discovered and she punished, but nobody took any interest in her. Nobody inquired. Nobody suspected it. If we had been patent nobilities, we should have had infinite trouble. And days and weeks would have been spent in investigations. So in a way, they, they have an advantage that they are not going to be found out. 
but um, there's still a matter of Sue and Jude are living together. And they are living as, you know, Sue calls it, as lovers. But I, I think that any, um, especially guy in Jude's position, would probably argue about that term, lovers. It's a little questionable about what they are. It says in the beginning of the chapter that she helps him with his work. Uh, she does the lettering. He's what's considered a, a monumental, um, a, a monument for like tombstones. Uh, they do the lettering and give monuments for for people who have died and, and needs a grave. Uh, she has experience in the lettering. There's a very artistic side to her. So they work together very well. She manages everything in the house, um, cooks dinner for him does all that stuff, but it does seem that um, the way that they're living, there's little hints of this, um, and I'll show you what I mean in, in here. Of course, Jude is still asking her, when are we going to get married? We, I mean, we can, we're can we free now, we can get married. And she's like, eh, <laughs> I don't like marriage. Um, so he says, I don't like, she says, I don't like to say no, dear Jude, but I feel just the same about it now as I've done all along. I have just the same dread, least an iron contract should extinguish your tenderness for me and mine for you, as it did between our unfortunate parents. So what can we do? I love you, as you know, Sue. I know it abundantly. But I think I would much rather go on living always as lovers as we are living now and only meeting by day. It is so much sweeter, for the woman at least, and when she is sure of the man, and henceforth we needn't be so particular as we've been about appearances. But they do need to be careful about appearances because there is the matter of work. And your reputation and that went to get, uh, goes together. Um, so as they are enjoying this freedom and they're they're doing what a lot of couples you know do today which works out fine um, except it's frowned upon in this society and so the more they look like they're quote lovers um, the more suspicious people are gonna are gonna come and people really did mind each other's business and so they're an odd couple anyways and Jude is already developing quite a past so this goes on and on and the question of marriage just keeps coming up and really Hardy does a lot in the next couple of chapters just to show the back and forth so let me just read this um, Yes, but admitting, admitting this or something like it to be true, you are not the only one in the world who, to see it, dear little Sue. People go on marrying because they can't resist natural forces. And this is important because of the element of naturalism. And if you remember when I talked about the rabbit getting caught in a trap, and it's a very um, stark image of being caught in a trap and, you know, he kills the rabbit to put it out of its misery. So what does that tell you? <laughs> but, I mean, all of this is meaningful. It's that naturalism of, like, you know, Darwin's stuff, you know, the survival of the fittest. And it's particularly difficult circumstances for poor people, for uneducated people, right? And, um, you know, class distinctions was the main thing in, the, in this time period where they're at. So a lot is going to be said about class, and you should prepare for a question of, of, of some kind like that on an AP test if you're watching this for AP review or something because that typically will come up 
So naturalism would be a good example to put in your essay. Um, and these are the, but notice it's a negative thing. That this isn't like the natural forces of falling in love. No, it's natural forces of forcing you to commit yourself for economic reasons. Like when her aunt asked, you know, oh, did you love him? And she says, oh, why, why do women marry? They, why do most men, women marry? They, they marry to get out of their situation. And I don't know that that's all that far off from today either, sometimes. But, you know, I'm a little bit like Hardy too. I'm a little pessimistic. But anyways, okay, so no doubt my father and mother, and there's, we go, the sins of the father again. They couldn't do it. Um, if they, you know, resembled us at all in our own thoughts and observations. But then they went and married just the same because they had ordinary passions. Meaning, at some point, somebody's got to have sex, and you're not going to do that. I mean, what am I supposed to do? Um, and that's the, that's that's a, a reasonable thing, you know, for, for Jude. Um, but, of course, in his, you know, living by the letter, he says, But you, Sue, are such a uh, phantasmal, bodiless creature, one who if you allow me to say it, has so little animal passion in you that you can act upon reason in the matter when we poor unfortunate wretches of grosser substance can't. So again, there's that flesh and spirit. Your spirit, but I'm flesh. And I'm not going to be able to um, go on with this. So... Sue, though, is content to stay as she is until her nemesis shows up. And then every time this happens, Sue breaks down. And, you know, the question keeps coming for, for Jude. I mean, he's real concerned. It's not so much as you don't want to get married, but I don't even know if you love me. Do you love me? And, you know, he says, trying to get a confession out of her, she's as slippery as an eel. But then when, in the next chapter, somebody's been at the door, and Sue instinctively knows it's Arabella, just by looking at her. So she tells her, um, no, Jude's not, he's not around. And then when Jude comes, she feels a little guilty about this and says, I, I said, I don't know if I did right, but I said, you're not at home. And he said, well, who was it? You know, what if she wanted a, a grave tombstone or something like that? And she says, it wasn't that. It, it, it was her. He said, well, how do you know? And uh, she said, because I could tell, I mean, the way she looked at me and she was this fleshy, coarse woman. And so there again, you have the flesh. Um, and he kind of defends her a little bit. This is why I wouldn't say she was coarse exactly. Maybe in the way she talks. But she was good looking when I, you know, married her. And, and Sue says, but she is. She is handsome. You know, if she was an ugly girl, Sue would probably be okay. <laughs> but, but Sue is human too. She just hates to admit it. Um, so, you know, Jude is, is, he doesn't know if she's in trouble, what's going on with her, who knows with Arabella, I gotta go figure out what she wants, and this is when Sue just completely has a fit, and says, but you can go see her tomorrow, Jude, don't go now, Jude, came in plaintive accents from the doorway, oh, it's only to entrap you, I know it is, as she did before, don't go, dear. She's such a low-passioned woman. I can see it in her shape and hear it in her voice. But I shall go, said Jude. Don't attempt to detain me, Sue. God knows I love her little enough now, but I don't want to be cruel to her. He turned to the stairs. But she's not your wife, cried Sue distractedly. And I... And you are not either, dear, yet said Sue. Oh, but are you going to her? Don't. Stay home. Please, please, stay, stay at home. Jude, and, and not go to her. 
now she's not your wife any more than I. Well, she is rather more than you, come to that, he said, taking his hat determinedly. I've wanted you to be, and I've waited with the patience of Job, and I don't see that I've got anything by my self-denial. I shall certainly give her something and hear what she is so anxious to tell me. No man could do less. And so Sue t takes this as, okay, now I've got to commit. We can get married. <laughs> Just don't go. <laughs> I'll do anything to keep, you know, you with me. And, and don't leave me. And this is where you start to see, you know, Hardy does a good job of showing Sue's elusiveness, but she's still flesh and bone too. And she has a very jealous, passionate nature. <clears throat> and so they'd argued about it, and um, Jude says, well, Arabella's appealed to me for help. I must go and speak to her, Sue. Um, I can't say anymore. Oh, if you must, you must, she said, bursting out in sobs that seemed to tear her her heart, tear her heart. I have nobody but you, Jude, and you're deserting me. I didn't know you were like this. I can't bear it. I can't. If she were yours, it would be different. Or if you were. Very well, then. If I must, I must. Since you will have it so, I agree. I will be. Only I didn't mean to. And I didn't want to marry again either but yes I agree I agree I do love you I ought to have known that you would conquer in the long run living like this she ran across and flung her arms around his neck I'm not a cold-natured sexless creature am I for keeping you at such distance I'm sure you don't think so wait and see I do belong to you don't I I give in I'll arrange for our marriage tomorrow, or as soon as you wish. Yay! <laughs> She's going to do it. Maybe. But that, it, at least that keeps him from going over to, um, you know, Arabella's hotel, when God knows what would happen there. But as Sue thinks about this the next morning, she starts to feel a little bit guilty about Arabella. What if she really did need something and she came all this way and oh my what did I do you know it's like she she calms down after a little bit and Jude's kind of used to this um, wishy-washy behavior and so Sue says I hope she wasn't shut out and that she hadn't walked the streets in the rain do you mind my putting on my waterproof and going to see if she got in I've been thinking of her all morning well, is it necessary? You haven't the least idea how Arabella is able to shift for herself. Still, darling, if you want to go and inquire, you can. There was no limit to the strange and unnecessary penances which Sue would meekly undertake when in a contrite mood, and this going to see all sorts of extraordinary persons whose relation to her was precisely of the kind that would have made other people shun them was her instinct ever. So that request did not surprise him. So Arabella is not expecting Sue to come, but that's who she gets. And uh, so this is a, a little bit befuddling to her. Oh, how stupid this is. I thought my visitor was your friend, your husband. Mrs. Farley, I suppose you call yourself? And she says, and indeed I don't. Oh, I thought you might have. Even if he's not really yours, decency is decency. You can go around saying you're not married. And she says, I don't know what you mean. And uh, she, Arabella kind of teases her a little bit and says, well, he wasn't your man yesterday. And this turns her um, rosette. <laughs> And she says, how do you know? And she says, well, from the, your manner. Of, you know, and, you know, this is, Arabella is a barmaid. She knows people very well. And uh, she's she's been around. And so she's kind of a, you know, a, a funny, um, in a way, kind of a, a 
almost a good judgment of character in a way. I mean, she knows exactly, but she's very calculating. Uh, she's really her own person, and I think that Sue kind of admires that. And I'll explain what I mean. She gives Sue a little bit of advi some advice as to, you need to go ahead and get married to him. And uh, it says, as for you, I should coax you to take me before the parson straight off and have done with it if I were in your place. I say it as a friend, my dear. He's waiting to any day, returned Sue with frigid pride. Then let him, in heaven's name, life with a man is more businesslike after it, and money matters work better. And then you see, if you have rows and he turns you out of doors, you can get the law to protect you, which you can't otherwise, unless he half runs you through with a knife or cracks your noodle with a poker. And if he bolts away from you, I say friendly, as woman to woman, for there's never any knowing what a man may do. You'll have the sticks of furniture and won't be looked upon as a thief. I shall marry my man over again, now that he's willing, as there was a little flaw in the first ceremony. So, a letter arrives serendipitously. Now Arabella, she was going to tell her uh, Jude that her husband has left. Her, whether I don't know, I'm, even, I'm confused at this point whether they're really married or not, but now he's taking her back, and they're going to make a real ceremony this time. So, um, this is, is, a, is a huge relief to Sue. But, like I said before, um, what what is it that she likes about Arabella when she goes back to Jude? Um, she says, yes, I, I can't help liking her. Just a little bit. She's not ungenerous, an, an ungenerous nature. And I'm so glad her difficulties have suddenly ended. She explained how Arabella had been summoned back and would be enabled to retrieve her position. I was referring to our old question, that question being marriage. What Arabella has been saying to me has made me feel more than ever how hopelessly vulgar an institution legal marriage is. A sort of trap to catch a man. I can't bear to think of it. I wish I hadn't promised to let you put up the bands this morning. And at this point, you know, Jude is just not really surprised <laughs> to hear that she's, she's having second doubts. But, you know, the thing I think that Sue likes about Arabella, Arabella can absolutely be herself. And she doesn't really have to apologize for it. Why? Because she's lower class. And that's the way it is. And, and you see that, you know, in, in um, one of Hardy's poems called The Ruined Maid. And she's kind of a, a comical character. But in a way, it's like, yeah, all you people got to act like this and I can do whatever I want. So, who's worse off? Sue still has the society, even though she's not, you know, I mean, she's only a little step above Arabella, but she's still a step above. And she's, you know, much more educated and, and more ladylike. And, you know, it's she's just been raised um, a little bit differently. And it's, it's been in, I think, Paris or something like that. Or no, it was London, London. And so there's a different, there's a side of Sue that really wants to just be as free as Arabella. But because of who she is, she can't. And I think that's that's what's kind of the strange contrast between the two as well. But Arabella does have something that she really does need to talk to Jude about. And now she has she hasn't been able to do it, so she says, Well, I'll just write him a letter. And in her letter, she informs, now this is chapter three of this part, that um, you know, I, I lied to you before about being pregnant, so I wouldn't, you know, blame you one bit if you didn't trust me, but um, I got pregnant right before we broke up and I have a son <laughs> he's yours and um, 
so far, and this would have been, you know, unfortunately very common, she hasn't been taking care of her son. She can't afford to. And the parents have been taking care of him. But now they're saying, well, since you've married and, you know, take your kid back. Um, or Jude, you have two living parents, one of you. And, it, you know, it, it's, it's kind of, he's, he's kind of like Jude in a way, growing up, um, as it says in the beginning of the book with Jude and the birds, where he says they, they seem to be living in a world where nobody wants them. And children really were seen as burden, as burdens. They, they got in the way. They got in the way economic. If you couldn't send them to a workhouse, which a lot of them did, um, and you had to take care of them, even though you know you willingly had them, this was a this was definitely a problem. And you see that, especially in the early Victorian era when uh, Charles Dickens was writing, of course Oliver Twist and. Um, you get that with great expectations is a good example of that too so she's going to send him his child but she put off writing the letter so the poor kid's going to show up at the train station and Jude and Sue aren't going to be there because they're just now getting the message and the little boy has to um, find his own way and he's uh, an interesting child he's is almost like a depressive child and he doesn't seem to share emotions whether they're positive or sad life is just the way it is now usually it takes a long time for a person to become that stoic but it's almost like he's born that way he's an old soul which is why his nickname that his grandparents gave him is father time and so I'll point back to a few descriptions of him because he, he's very significant especially to the ending but um, Sue says the poor child seems to be wanted by nobody Sue replied and her eyes filled with tears now they're not really quite sure if this kid is going to be uh, Jude's or not but Jude had by this time come to himself what a view of life he must have Mine or not mine, he said. I must say that if I were better off, I should not stop for a moment to think whose he might be. I would take him and bring him up. The beggarly question of parentage, what is it after all? What does it matter? When you come to think of it, whether a child is yours by blood or not, all the little ones of our time are collectively the children of us adults of the time and entitled to our general care. That excessive regard of parents for their own children and their dislike of other people's is like class feeling, patriotism, save your own soulism, and other virtues, a mean exclusiveness at bottom. And Sue's like, preach on. We're, we'll take this kid in, and um, you know, I if he's if he's not yours all the better <laughs> because in a way she, she's you know and it, it kind of like um it, like sue uh, jude had the same feeling early on like i wonder what sue's child would be like but then it'd be philip's son too sue's a little too jealous to be um overly excited about this uh, so the child is left on his own and he starts, it's pointed in the right direction and starts walking that way and Hardy writes, The child fell into a steady mechanical creep which had in it an impersonal quality, the movement of a wave or the breeze or of a cloud. That's a good image for him. Uh, he followed his directions literally without an inquiring gaze at anything. It could have been seen that the boy's idea of life were different from those of the local boys. And then he tells us that, that children begin with detail and work their way up to the uh, general. They begin with the um, contiguous and gradually comprehend the universal. The boy seemed to have begun with the generals of life and never to have concerned himself with the particulars. So 
it's sort of like teaching literature. You know, it, it, once students get over the literal stage, which, you know, can last through ninth grade, um, it can last forever. But <laughs> what you try to do is get the theme, get thematic. And, 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 but children, start with detail. Start with the literal. This is what it said happened. That's not what it meant. But, you know, I mean, you, you kind of have to get them to critically think. This boy already sees the universal, and it doesn't. It's not. He's not curious about the details. He doesn't care what other kids would be looking at if they were walking. You know, they like climb a tree or something, or may as well have some fun. He just goes on mechanically. Later, Jude says something to the effect about being one of those boys who've seen all the sorrows in life before he's even caught up to it. I'm not quoting that right at all, but the idea is that he has already been burdened with life's sorrows and troubles way before, you know, he should. Like, you know, the Bible says you should enjoy life when you're young, you know, before all these other things that can happen to you. Enjoy your youth. Um, and but he can't because he already sees kind of like the whole future which is very pessimistic and um, he seems to know this all too well so he shows up and uh jude is of course a little angry with arabella I mean, she didn't even tell me you know which is was just you know it was something that she did out of carelessness um, and it, Sue is a little taken back at first and says, you know, what Arabella says, it's true. I see you in him. Well, that's one thing in my life, as it should be at any rate. But the other half of him is she, and that's what I can't bear. But I ought to. I'll try to get used to it. Yes, I ought. And, you know, one of the things that is said about Jude and Sue that I don't normally bring up just because I... I don't know, I don't want to get stuck on it with an essay question when there's so many other themes. But it, it's, she's sort of like his double, which may be why it's so difficult to see this other child. Um, Phillotson says that, you know, it's almost like there are two people split. And then if you look at it in terms, if you were going to say something about uh, Sue being his double, definitely say something about the fact that one is flesh and one is spirit and then you can go much deeper with that no don't just stick to the literary element because that's what a lot of people would do anyway so Sue, uh, jude says jealous little sue i withdrew all remarks about your sexlessness never mind time will may write things and sue darling i have an idea we'll educate him and train him with the view of the university what I couldn't accomplish in my own person, perhaps I can carry out through him. They're making it easier for poor students now, you know. And the thing is that, um, especially after this book was published, it was starting to change, sort of like the marriage laws. And uh, it's because we're, we're looking towards the turn of a century here. This is the late 19th century. Um, but it also shows that Jude is still the dreamer, you know, and he's getting a little bit up there, but now I got a son. He could do it, you know, and it, this is what a lot of people do to their children. Unfortunately, you know, it's, uh, you know, I couldn't do it, so you better go to college. I, you know, that kind of thing and this um, hopeful idealism that, Things are going to be much better for him. They have to be. But at any rate, I'll leave it to that and um, start with the second. I don't know how long this is, but I'll figure it out. All right. Thanks for listening. See you.